Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you today. Again, my name is Eric Hogue. I am a PGA certified member. I have the distinction of actually working for the organization of which I am a member, which is a little bit different. Um, working for the PGA is a wonderful experience. I, I get to play with a lot of new toys. Uh, just, just wonderful. Uh, Jerry says he wants to get into my... <laughs> Jerry Lovell says he wants to get into my throwaway closet. So uh, it's, it's wonderful. I do get to work on some of the greatest and brightest minds. I do get to, uh, to be around some of the greatest and brightest people. Uh, when Mr. Nix and, and Jerry invited me to talk today um, about teaching, uh, I wanted to do a couple of different things. I, I want to go through this and I want to tell you a little bit about how I am trained as a PGA member for instruction. I want to talk a little bit about how that instruction can be used for fitting and has to be used in fitting. And I want to take you through some of the things that we do at the PGA Center. Um, before I get started, I was, uh, I was told when you give a speech that uh, one of the things you ought to do is that you ought to envision the audience in their underwear. And I can tell you from my perspective, it's uh, pretty awe-inspiring. That's all. I'll just put it right there. So, all right. But uh, again, my name is Eric. I work swing mechanics used in professional club fitting. And let me go ahead and start here. Uh, the best lesson, some of the things that happen in a golf swing are pretty dramatic. Some of the things that happen in a golf swing should not be discussed with your student. This is one of my favorites. See if I can get this to work here. Hold on. This is J.C. Anderson. Daniel. Hold on here. should come up with a picture, shouldn't it? What, is, you know, what, are, what are the secrets? What are the secrets of golf that pros know? Well, I heard this one time, and I, I remembered it, and it's really, if you'd write this down, it really helped. What I try to do, I try to flat load my feet so I can snap load my power package. That way I can amplify both lag and drag pressure through impact fix. As long as my number two power accumulator doesn't break down, I can reach maximum centripetal force with minimum pivotal resistance. You see, the pivot is the utilization of multiple centers to produce a circular motion for generating centrifugal force on an adjusted plane, plus the maintenance and balance necessary to promote the two-line delivery path. See, golf is geometrically oriented layer force. It involves a physical muscular thrust and a geometry of the circle. You can divide the golf swing into 24 basic components, each having between 12 and 15 variations. Now, when you think of all this and you get it all set, hopefully you'll hit shots like this. Sometimes golf instruction does feel that way, doesn't it? I was, I've been very fortunate in my career. I, I, somebody told me early in my teaching career, they said, uh, and these are words that you can, you can go by, you can really write this down, uh, instead of what J.C. Anderson just said, whatever that was. Uh, you ought to tell your student half what you think they need, because that's usually twice as much as they can handle. And I think truer words have never been spoken. I appreciated Fred this morning talking about simplistic things. And I think that's very true. A lot of times, so many teachers that I see and that I've been around want to tell you what they know, not necessarily what you need. And so uh, to me, I, I, as we go through here, golf instruction and professional club fitting, are we partners or are we pugilists? Okay. I hope partners. For the betterment of all, I've, I've had so many students that come to me with clubs that are way too long, way too heavy, and way too upright and I know what they're going to be doing before I see them make a golf swing by looking in their bag. But I think that can work the other way around too. If we are teaching in an incorrect way, we can't fit you for what you need to do. To me, this is the central question of what I want to discuss today. Are we partners or are we pugilists? Are we going to be fighting against each other? I want to go through a little bit again about how I'm trained and Dane, this will probably be fairly familiar. I think you know somebody who might have written some of this stuff. but. Uh, Dane's father, uh, Dr. Gary Weir, is a wonderful, wonderful golf professional, wrote a lot of the training manuals that we have used in the PGA for a number of years. But really, golf instruction can be boiled down into three key components, which are laws, principles, and preferences. Laws are absolutes, and they are simply reserved for ball flight. 
There are only five of them. We'll get to them in just a minute. Everything that we deal with when we're instructing people, when we're instructing our students, is trying to get these five laws to work out. Principles are subjective judgments related to the golf swing, which again we'll discuss here in a minute. And then finally, preferences are where teachers work. This is uh, descriptions of style and choice. Uh, it's interesting, you go to one professional and he tells you that your swing's too upright, and you go to another professional and he tells you your swing's too flat. Well, you know what, both are correct for their system, for what they're trying to accomplish. So laws, let's take a look at those. There are again only five of them, and I bet we've heard of most of these. Speed, centeredness of hit, path of the golf club, face orientation, and angle of approach. These are the five laws that we're instructed that control ball flight. These have to do with the 14 major principles that we are taught as golf professionals. And probably some of these look fairly familiar as well. Grip, aim, setup, plane, position, dynamic balance, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, swing centers, connection, impact, right? And then last but not least, our preferences. And these, again, is where teachers work. I'm very fortunate where I work. I get to rub elbows with uh, the likes of a Mike Bennett, who was one of the co-inventors of the stack and tilt swing method. Well, you know what? Jimmy Ballard might be around next week, too. It'd be interesting to get those two in a conversation. But uh, yeah, again, everyone is correct in their own system, but is that system correct for you is really where we need to be spending our time. So laws, principles, and preferences. Laws, principles, and preferences. The game of golf is divided into 35% full shots, 25% shorter shots, pitches, chips, bunker shots, 40% putting, 100% frustrating. Okay. It is interesting to me that these percentages do not change dramatically regardless of the ability level. Okay. Tiger Woods percentages are just about the same as the rank beginners. So it is interesting, if you look at those numbers, we spend so much time teaching and so much time fitting for full swing, particularly driver, 35% of the game. I don't know how else I can try to convince my students that we do not need to work on your driver today. There are other parts of the game that we need to be spending some time. Well, we actually have some pretty interesting machines at the center, linkstracker.com. That is a, a, a website that you should write down. Linkstracker.com is one of our product partners. They are a statistical shot making, a statistical game keeping system. It is a wonderful tool to convince your students that yes, that driver is wonderful and I might be able to glean you another six or seven feet out of that distance with that driver if we spend some time together. But why don't we work on putting? No, 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 no. we got to work on my driver. I, my, my buddy's out hitting me by three or four steps. Well, if I help you 10% with 35% of the game, I help you four shots. If I help you 10% with 65% of the game, you can do the math. Linkstracker.com, it's a wonderful resource for you. All right, I want to break some of this down into some of the teaching styles that we have. Uh, method teaching and cause and effect teaching are the two styles that I deal with with my students and also some of the teachers that we, are, uh, that, that we see. Stack and tilt, one plane, two plane, Jimmy Ballard's system, David Ledbetter. Most of us have a system that we prefer. I think the great teachers can modify their systems to fit the student, student-led lessons. Method teaching basically says that there is a best way to swing a golf club, and that is to move players into a more structured program of swing mechanics. I always like to say that if you're really good with a hammer, everything in life begins to look a little bit like a nail. Okay, right? If you have long limbs, if you have short limbs, I think that there are different methods that you can use. But myself at five foot nine with relatively long arms for my height might prefer a different style of play, might prefer a different style of swing than somebody who is, say, five foot four with shorter arms who's a little bit stronger than I am. Methods work, but I don't think they work for everyone. Cause and effect teaching is dealing with other things. They are dealing with dynamic swing relationships with limitation of correct and incorrect analysis. Efficiency of motion with player preferences are emphasized. Um, I personally, when I give a lesson, I feel like I know where I'm going in the lesson before I ever see a player hit a shot. The player interview, actually how they're walking to the tee, what hand do they reach into their pocket to grab the wallet to pay for the lesson. If, is, they're playing right-handed, but they sign the check left-handed. A lot of things that you can glean just by watching somebody walk, watching somebody move. And I think if we can understand some of those aspects of teaching, 
again, student-led lessons, then I think we can have a student-led lesson instead of a teacher-led lesson. Okay? Teaching and fitting styles. Again, quick fix or simply building neuromuscular pathways for long-term player development. Now that's a long-winded way of saying, is this, are we in this for the long haul or is the club championship next week? Okay. These are two very distinct different types of lessons. The first one, quick fix, I think emphasis on club performance and club fitting can be very, very strong indicator. Very, very strong. I don't know how many times I've had some statement like that coming to the lesson team. Gosh, you know, I haven't played in two years, but the company outing is on Tuesday. Can you help me? Well, yeah, I can help you. Okay, we're going to go through a different lesson than I would if you said the club championship starts in 2013. Can you help me? We're going to have a very different lesson. Okay, I call this triage or microwave mentality. I am not really necessarily teaching long-term player development in this type of lesson. I am trying to get you through the weekend. Now, there is nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with teaching someone in this mentality. In fact, a significant percentage of my lessons are this mentality, unfortunately. Okay. It takes a long, term, long time to develop actual neuromuscular pathways, which is the way my brain tells my muscles to move in the simplest terms. It's hard to do over a weekend. There's all kinds of studies that I've seen. I'm sure you have too. It takes somewhere around 10,000 repetitions to change a motor skill. I doubt you are going to have 10,000 repetitions before tomorrow's club championship. So what, do we can, what can we do in this quick fix mentality? Well, I think it comes down to balancing the cart. And this is a teaching philosophy that I think is not taught enough. I appreciate Jim Hardy. If anybody has spent some time with Mr. Hardy or read any of his books, he does this wonderfully. I get students that come to me that slice the golf ball. Anybody else get that besides me? Yeah, about 93% of all students, right? What's the primary cause of a slice? Simplest terms, is it an open club face? All right, if I'm a player and have any kind of ability and I am slicing the golf ball because of my open face, where am I going to swing the club? To the right of the target or to the left of the target as a right-hander? I'm going to try to swing it to the left of the target to compensate for the open face. Does that help? Well, it can, I guess. You know, there's a relationship between how the face works and how the path works, but it is a complementary or compens compensatory activity. So here's me as a student. Okay, I'm going to fix this guy. He's got an open club face. I'm going to look at his grip. Ah, his grip's open. I'm going to fix that open grip. I fix his open grip. Now I get the club face more neutral. Where does he hit the golf ball? Did I help him or hurt him? Okay, now he's lining up left because he slices the ball. I fix his club face and he pull hooks everything for three weeks. Right? I'm correct. I did fix his club face, but I didn't balance the cart. Okay. This is where teaching and I think fitting and I think instruction fails 90% of the time. Is we, yes, you know what, I read a magazine last week that says you're, if you play the ball position too far forward, you're going to do X, Y, or Z. Well, maybe he's moving the ball forward because he's doing A, B, and C, and that compensates for his problem. Always got to look one step deeper, especially in the quick fix mentality. What I like about balancing the card here or excuse me, what I like about building pathways for long-term development, it is not necessarily tomorrow afternoon reference. I can work on one thing at a time on the bottom of the screen instead of at least two things at a time on the top of the screen. Commitment to new fields and concepts, process-oriented learning and teaching. Now here's the problem that I face. I get a student that comes to me. Mr. Smith, are you going to be a uh, in this for the long haul, or are you trying to make something happen this afternoon? Oh, I'm in this for the long haul. 97% of all my students tell me they're in this for the long haul. And three swings later, when the ball flight is not of their liking, how come this isn't working, pro? This isn't working. Okay? That's kind of frustrating. So to me, you can ask that question, and I still do. I kind of get a chuckle out of it sometimes. You can ask the question, are you in this for the long haul, or is this a quick fix that we're after? Everybody's going to tell you that they're in this for the long haul. But it's our job as fitters and teachers to ask the next question, at least internally. Is this guy telling me the truth? Is this really what happens? Is this a true story? Okay. Very important, I think, deciding where you're going to be teaching in these, in these situations. 
I do want to go through, again, just a couple of, uh, actually, I've got three in, the, in your packets, but I'm only going to put two on the screen here for time. There are a lot of instruction myths out there, and this one, to me, is absolutely right on top. Has anybody ever said this or been taught this? Is this a great thought? I personally think this individual thought is going to put all of my children through college. Okay? Whoever came up with this thought, I want to send them a thank you card with a gift card in it. Okay? Keep your head down to me is absolutely the worst piece of advice you could ever give a student. It is not an athletic motion. If you want to compare it to a different sport, let's compare it to baseball. I want the pitcher to never stop looking at the third baseline and throw to home plate. Does that work very well? In fact, there are only two players that I've ever said that do pick their head up. Here's one of them. She did pretty well. The other one, by the way, would be David Duvall. The head is part of the spine, and as the spine rotates, it, again, let me back up a half step. This is pretty interesting. Most people call this shoulder turn. Do the shoulders have anything to do with this motion? What is this, should this be called? Spine turn, or thoracic, or, or a trunk turn, or core turn, something along those lines. I like spine turn, actually. Is the head part of the spine? If the spine is turning, should the head turn with it? Okay, if the head stays down, we are limiting rotation forward, which usually limits power. If we keep the head in the ground, I am stressing the cervical vertebrae in my spine. As we go forward, I usually stop, flip, pull, do all kinds of things I don't want to do through the golf swing. The absolute number one piece of poor advice, or in my perspective, the greatest piece of advice ever invented in the history of golf instruction. Keep your head down. Okay? Instruction myth number two, keep your left arm straight. Good piece of advice, bad piece of advice. All right, I think it's a bad piece of advice, and the reason is, is the arms are the link from the chest to the golf club. Okay. Just like a rope, if it was a link from my hand to the end of that rope, or a towel, snap a towel in a boy's locker room when you're a kid. You want that towel tight, or you want that towel loose and pliable? Okay. As I swing, I want that club to be roping or, or throwing with my arms, not tense with my arms. I do think the left arm stays relatively straight for a right-handed player, but I don't keep it straight. I have all the extension I need at the address position. I don't need to create any more. Anybody remember this player? Has not changed in 40 years. Five-time British Open champion. Eight majors. One of the greatest players that ever lived. Probably the greatest win player that ever lived. Is that left arm perfectly straight? Especially for our students that are a little bit limited in their rotary capacity. Let them have the freedom to let, use that left elbow. Let them have the freedom to lose, use that left elbow. Okay. Pre-swing instruction can be boiled down into three different aspects. Posture, grip, and alignment. PGA. All right. Very good. Little, little promotion there. That's right. Posture, grip, and alignment. I tell my students, my beginning students, if we can nail these three elements, and I'm going to quickly go through some of these elements, but if we can nail these three elements of the pre-swing conditions, then it's going to be a whole lot easier to do all these things that you read about in Golf Magazine. A posture, grip, and alignment. By the way, guess what I teach the tour level players that I teach? Guess which three things I'm interested in talking about right away? Okay. It does not change. One of my favorite quotes is from Arnold Palmer when he said, golf is not difficult, or excuse me, golf is not complicated, it's just difficult. Okay. The great players need as much help, if not more help, in these three areas than the average player does. Do not discount the fact that, gosh, I've got this single-digit handicapper comes in. We're going to have to be talking about something besides posture, grip, and alignment. If I give 500 lessons a year, 494 of them have something to do with one of these three topics, if not multiple. Okay, posture, grip, and alignment. Let's take a look at posture first. Primary angle. Primary angle in a golf swing is the tilt from the hip joints forward into the golf ball. How much primary tilt should we have? Well kind of goes back to those preferences. If you look at a one-plane type golf swing, you want more primary tilt. If you want a two-plane golf swing, like a David Toms or a Davis Love III, you are going to want less primary tilt. But it's basically forward tilting from the hip sockets. Interestingly enough, 
when I tilt forward, where does my weight go? Do I want my weight on my toes? Not in my world. Not in my world. I don't like weight on the toes. How do I counterbalance weight going forward by tilting forward? God gave us a nice uh, God-given counterbalance, didn't he? Right? I need to push my hips backwards as much as my hips go forward. If you look at one of my basic looks, one of, one of the first things I look at with my students is the back edge of the hips. If you drop a plumb bob off the tailbone of every, just about every good ball striker, at least every swing that I respect, you'll find a spot somewhere between five and seven inches behind the heels. Five and seven inches behind the heels, right there. Okay. That keeps the weight on the center of my feet. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about balance here and a little bit later, but primary angle, very important. Okay. Is it different with different clubs? Well, what's the lie angle on a driver? Well, is it the same as the lie angle on a sand wedge? Well, I think those would require different body angles to match different lie angles and lengths, for that matter. So no, it is different for different clubs. A six iron, or excuse me, a driver is going to be 58 or so degrees. Sand wedge is going to be 64, 65 degrees. There's going to be somewhere between five and seven degrees of body angle change between the shortest and the longest golf clubs. Okay. What about shape and motion? Should the spine angle be flat? How many times have you heard the spine angle should be flat? Well, as I'm standing here, is my spine flat? No, it's not, isn't it? There's a little inward curvature in the low spine. There's a little X or out, outside curvature, a little kyphosis in the top of the spine. Okay. Basically, what I tell my students is I want normal standing posture tilted to a new angle. What I see so often is that if somebody comes for a lesson and they're coming to the PGA, gosh, I'm really going to make this perfect, and they hyperextend their lower back to the point where they can't move. Normal standing posture tilted to a new axis. Okay? How many of you have seen this as well? Okay. I like what Fred was saying this morning about reaching for the golf ball usually rounds the top of the spine. What's wrong with a rounded spine or a hyperextended lordotic area back here? All right? Absolutely, you cannot move. Each individual vertebrae, especially in the thoracic area of your spine, has about five degrees of rotary capacity to it. You multiply that by 10 discs, you've got about 50 degrees of independent torso rotation, unless your spine is tilted or rounded. If we round the top edge of the spine or hyperextend the low end of the spine, then we're taking away the flexibility of each of those little vertebrae. So let's just say instead of five degrees, I rounded my spine, now I've only got two degrees. Well, I just limited myself 20 degrees in that, those 10 disc areas, 20 degrees of rotation. Uh, limitation on turn, mm -hmm. is that something, a lack of strength in the core, or is there a, a physical malady, or what? What's yes, the all the above. All, all the above. Great question, all of the above. Go ahead, speak it a little louder. Limitation on turn, is that caused by a weakness Ooh, in the core crap, muscle, or is it caused crap. by something with the spine? Is that all the above? Yeah, it, I think the answer to that question is you'll have as many different answers to that question as, as you do for as many different players as you have. It can be a, a, a disc issue. I don't, one of my pre-swing lesson questions is always, have you had any phys do you have any physical limitations? No, no I don't. And then I watch them hit balls and they have a 12 degree shoulder rotation. I say, you know, your shirt's a little short. Well, you know, my shoulder last year, I had a rotator cuff surgery. Oh, really? You know, physical limitations. So always continue to probe those questions. Gosh, you know, you're sliding a little bit off the golf. Well, you know, last year I blew out my knee, right? Yes, they are physical limitations, even when they tell you. The students will not tell you the truth. They're there to impress you. You have to delve deeper to get them to tell you the truth, right? All right, secondary angle. Secondary angle is sideways tilt. And this, again, goes back to preferences. Should there be sideways tilt in a golf swing? Well, to me, the answer, I think, at least from a physiognomy standpoint, is yes. Which hands, for a right-handed player, which hand's lower on the golf club? Right. So which shoulder is lower? Right. Now, God built the body here, shoulders across, spine up and down, perpendicular, right? So if my shoulders are offline, well, I guess I could just do this with my shoulder blades here, my scapula. I guess I could just try to stick one left, left shoulder in my ear but I don't want to do anything athletic from that position. So I think the best thing to do is I think there should be a little sideways tilt. By the way, would you have more sideways tilt with a wedge or a driver? 
Yeah, ball position would be more forward with a driver, wouldn't it? So I think driver may be slightly more forward tilt. Now, again, talk to a stack and tilt guys, and they would hate that discussion right there. It's not right or wrong. It's just preference. It's just preference. I personally think there should be some sideways tilt because I don't want my, my shoulders offline from my spine here. Okay, with the feet, how wide should your feet be? I, I think that's a pretty good rule of thought, but again, your feet can fool you. What if you got a guy that's got a lot of toe flare? In fact, I've got toe flare up here. Might as well put it up here. And get this to work. There we go. Let me back up. There we go. Foot flare. Yeah, what if you got a, a, a lot of foot flare in a student? He comes to you and he looks like Donald Duck here. He's got a little, little toe flare. How do you know what feet shoulder width is? Which part of your foot, which part of your shoulder are you looking for? I, I kind of like ankle joints and shoulder joints. Okay, look at the ankle joints, the back of the heel, not the toes. Toes can fool you. And the shoulder joints. And by the way, should it be the same width with every club? No, I don't think it should either. I liked uh, that slide uh, this morning with David Ledbetter, having three different irons, three different stances of golf club. Make the stance commensurate with the length of the shot. Shorter shots, shorter swings. Shorter base. What is wrong with having feet too wide? Okay, you're always fighting mobility and flexibility. The wider you are, the larger the base of support. But the limitation of motion starts to come in there. Narrow stance, maximum flexibility, limitation of base of support. Why would Michelle Wee have a wider stance than normal? Okay, she's tall, six foot three. Yeah, do you think she lacks flexibility? That female and 22 years old and six foot three? Yeah, so probably a little base of support might not be bad for her, right? How about uh, Craig Statler? Have you seen the width of his stance? Oh, that's probably true. <laughs> probably hasn't seen his feet lately. So he probably does not lack for a base of support, but maybe needs some flexibility. So that is malleable depending on your student. Okay. Grip. Difficult is a quick fix. A grip is the first thing I look at for my student and the last thing I change typically. 40% of your body's nerve endings end in your hands. Simply put, if in the first 10 minutes of a lesson I change your grip, the lesson is over because I have just altered your universe. Okay? I'm not saying I never work on grip. I do. But be very careful. When you change somebody's grip, you are going to make them feel extremely uncomfortable in a very short period of time. In a very short period of time. I'll go through these quickly. There are some, some basics. The usual suspects of the grips here. The Varden or the half Varden. Hogan actually used a half Varden, which means the pinky of the, of the right hand for Hogan was actually draped across the back of his knuckle where most people will actually put it in the crease between the left index finger and the middle finger. I think both are acceptable. Um, interlocking, Tiger Woods, Jack Nicklaus, there's been a number of great players that have used that one. And this one, the 10 finger or the baseball grip. Does anyone teach away from the 10 finger or baseball grip? Good, nobody does. Uh, some of the greatest players that ever lived had a 10 finger grip. Mo Norman comes to mind, wonderful ball striker. Actually got to see him once when I was in Canada, but. But yes, especially with my younger players, especially for my players with limitation of forearm strength, love the 10 finger grip. Love the 10 finger grip for them. It makes them feel more comfortable. They get more meat on the golf club. There's nothing wrong with, either, with any of these three grips. Yes, probably the majority of tour players, or I should say that the, the, the most popular grip on tour would be the Varden or the overlapping grip, but it is simply not, uh, not a mandate for me. You can hit any shot you want with any three of those grips, any three of those grips. What about pressure? Has anyone hold, uh, been told, hold the club like a baby bird? The old Sam Sneed quote. Anybody teach that? Well, when you swing a golf club, let's just say you swing a driver, driver head about 200 grams, let's say, you've got a 65 gram shaft, 50 gram grip, a little bit here and there, add all those numbers up. When you're swinging at 100 miles an hour, how much does that golf club weigh? Yeah. A lot, somewhere between 60 and 80 pounds is what, is what I would, basically if you do the math, that's what it comes out to. How tightly would you hold something that weighs 60 to 80 pounds? Would you hold it like a baby bird? Okay, so let me ask you this question. If you start like a baby bird and you finish without the club flying out of your hands, what happened to your grip pressure during the swing? Okay, so be very careful with hold that like a baby bird. Either that or they broke your, your mirror in the shop, right, as they threw the club out of their hands, which we don't want either. 
on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being extremely tight, my grip pressure is about a five. My grip pressure is about a five. But what's my arm pressure again? Very, very light. So my fingers, my encircling fingers are holding onto the golf club, my arms are not. My arms are not. I always like what Hogan said about the five fingers that hold the golf club, the last three of the left hand for a right-handed player, and the middle two of the bottom hand. Those are the five fingers that really hold the golf club. Um, closed and open, strong and weak. All of us were taught as kids strong grips and weak grips. Can you play with a strong grip? You know, Arnold Palmer would say yes. Can you play with a weak grip? You know, ben Hogan would say yes. Grip is not a mandate. There is a zone of success, to borrow that term from Jim McLean. There is a zone of success with the grip. I'd be honest with you, I'd prefer to use the terms open and closed instead of strong and weak. When I think strong and weak, it tends to speak more to pressure in the hands and not to direction in the hands. Okay, a closed grip would be defined as which side? Let me borrow this for a second. Would this be a strong or an open grip? Okay, I would call that closed. The way this works, just to let you know, at speed, at centrifugal force, at that 85 pounds of pull in the golf club, Centrifugal force, Isaac Newton here wants to straighten the left shoulder joint, the left elbow joint, and the left wrist joint all in a straight line with the shaft. Okay, so, oh here, I got some clubs back here. Thanks. <laughs> all right, so if I have this left hand in a, everybody agree, a closed position or a strong position? As soon as I swing it at speed, as soon as this arm stretches, what happens to the golf club? Well, it'll shut down, won't it? This grip would be considered a, okay, and as soon as I straighten my arm, what happens to the club face? Okay, now here's the deal. I'm strong enough to lift 60 to 80 pounds, so guess what? I'm tired of hitting it right, so I'll fix it. Okay, open at impact. No, it isn't. Well, it's square at impact, but I just turned a six iron into a nine iron. Hit it fat, probably. Tired of hitting it fat, I'll fix that too. Okay, and so now we've got this series of dominoes stacked up here, but it's all related to the club face. You know, so many, anybody, anybody know what this is called? Fine wing, chicken wing, right leg, yeah. Anybody want to get that out of your student's swings? You better fix the club face first. That club face, or that, that chicken wing is not the problem. It's the fix for the problem. It's the fix for the problem, right? Open club face, no it isn't. Oh, but I just hit it fat because my hands are behind impact. I'll fix that too. Right, and you can follow these little dynamics, these little A plus B equals C type formulas to really start to see what's going on in your golf swing. Okay? So be careful what you want to fix. You might just, again, unbalance that cart. Be careful what you want to fix first. Okay? Palmy grip. Is this the largest error that you see in your students? Because it is for me. What is wrong with a palmy left-hand grip for a right-handed player? Anybody know what I'm, everybody know what I mean by a palmy grip? Yeah, I like that picture of Hogan I saw this morning, right underneath the little heel pad back here, the hypothenar back here. Palmy grip. What's wrong with the palmy grip? Well, that sure does, right? That's as far as I can hinge that wrist with a palmy grip. Get it down in the pad, underneath that heel pad, I get about 35 degrees more hinging capacity, and it's more secure, right? Remember that 80 pounds of pull, Mr. Upshaw? You want to pull that away from me? Hey, wait a minute, he can't pull that away from me because I have that heel pad as a counterweight. Right? If I put it in the palm of my hand and he tried to do that, I don't have nearly the control of it that I would have. He's stealing my clubber. <laughs> right? So yes, palmy grip, I think, is the absolute number one problem that I see, particularly with beginners. The easiest way to tell what your student is doing when they're in your shop is ask them to pull out their glove. And you will see where they are wearing their glove pattern. Is it back here on the lifeline? Is it underneath the pad? Is it down in the fingers? Is it up on the thumb? I really like to look at my students' glove, grips, or, or gloves, excuse me. Right. The absolute number one problem, palmy grip. Alignment? Hmm? Do you try and take them away from a glove? No, the I, I, uh, question was, do you try to take a student away from a glove? I personally think it's a, an absolute individual decision. If they have sweaty hands, if, if they can't hold on the golf club, I might encourage them to. 
But no, I don't think it, I don't think it's a necessity. Fred Couples does not play with a grip or with a glove. They asked him why one day. He said, "When I was a kid, I couldn't afford it, so he just learned to play without a glove." I think it's total personal decision. Total personal decision. I want to run through a lineman here. Okay, upper body. Should the upper body be on the target or parallel to the target? Parallel to the target. Should the lower body be on the target, parallel to the target, or does it matter? The textbook says parallel. Well, why did the greatest ball striker that ever lived have his lower body about 20 degrees open? Jack Nicklaus. So he restricts his backswing and also encourages his downswing and follow through. Nicholas was so big and bulky, he couldn't finish his golf swing, so Jack Grout allowed him to move the left foot back a little bit. What about Gary Player? Uh -huh. Both. Both. You know, Fred brings up a great point. I, I, I think that when we look at alignment, especially in the lower body, look at the back of the heels instead of the toes. Toes, again, can fool you. Look at the back edge of the heels, and is it parallel to the target line? Right. Gary Player pulled his right foot back. Why? Because he wanted to try to hit it as far as Jack did, right? He wanted a bigger, bigger turn. So, yeah, lower body can be influencing the golf swing, but it is not a mandated. By the way, both Nicholas and Gary Player had upper bodies that were dead square. Well, Jack was slightly left, I'll be honest with you. All right. Is it going to be different with different golf clubs? Do you want to hit ascending on a driver or descending on a driver? Is it easier to hit ascending on a driver from a steep path or a shallow path? Is it encouraging of a shallower path with a closed stance or an open stance? It's encouraging more with a closed stance, isn't it, to be a little more ascending? So you'll see, I love that, if anybody has not read that five lessons, the modern fundamentals of golf by Hogan, he's got a little diagram in there about how he moved his right foot further away from his left foot and also deeper or more closed as he got longer into the, longer into the sets. So yes, I think that's specific to player, but it's also specific to club. Parallel or on target, we've already covered. Ball position, same for all golf clubs. Now again, ascending with the driver, descending with the wedges, we're going to move the ball around. I typically do not like to see a student with the ball position behind their sternum. Okay. When I do that, I think the fastball just went by me. And I can't quite catch up, and I usually miss that to right field. So be careful. And by the way, I don't like using feet, and it's a personal thing. I don't like using feet for ball position discussions. I think the feet, again, can fool you. If my stance is open or closed or narrow or, du or duck-footed or, or pigeon-toed, I, I think that can fool you. Use something in the upper body, sternums, left ear, shoulder joints, something along those uh, lines. I like using the upper body. That's a personal thing. Uh, player vision and pre-shot routine. I am extremely right eye dominant. You can take my left eye out, and I probably wouldn't notice it until about Thanksgiving. Okay, so guess what my habit is. If I'm right eye dominant and I've got this big Irish nose, would, would I have a tendency to line up to the right or to the left? Well, to the left, right? Because my right eye wants to see down the target line. So I have a tendency to open the body. It's not good, it's not bad, it's, it's just an indicator. So be careful. If you, when, you, when, you, when you close somebody's uh, body, be careful that they can still see what they want to see. You've got to work with your student on an individual basis with that. That's why I think pre-shot routines are so important. Okay? Practice versus play, is that going to be different with regard to alignment? I see so many of my students out there, and they will be slicing the golf ball. And I come back and I'm driving by the range and I see them practicing and they're hitting it right at their target. They're just lined up 30 yards to the left. Okay. Hey, I'm hitting it on target. That's great. Well, yeah, but you're compensating an open club face by adjusting your alignment. So I think when you practice, I think every single shot you hit should have a pre-shot routine attached to it. Because you will work yourself into a compensation alignment position to work on your ball flight. Every single shot you hit should have a pre-shot routine attached to it. Plus you'll hit fewer balls, but get more work done. You won't be so tired at the end of the night. All right. First looks and concepts. Now that's, that's basically how I see the golf swing, and I, I want to spend a few minutes and I want to talk about uh, a great machine that we have. First looks and concepts. These are the things that I think as fitters and as teachers we should be looking for first. Grip, direction, and angle to the body. We already talked about open and closed, or again, most people call it square, um, the strong and weak, but I want to talk to you about angle to the body, and let me, uh, let me change directions here for just a second, and I will call up, hold on just a second if you would,
Well, that's not the posture we were looking for, is it? This is uh, Ben Crane, good ball striker. And hold on just a minute. Let me get back here. Can't get to my drawing tools. All right. I personally like to see spine angles and shaft angles at roughly perpendicular angles. If you draw a line from his tailbone to the base of his head and then draw a line up the shaft of the golf club, you will form approximately a 90 degree angle. Now if you're a two plane swinger, you can have a little taller posture. If you're a one plane swinger, maybe a little less than that. But I tend to, one of the first things I look for is from that angle, from the tailbone to the back of the head, and then is that roughly perpendicular to the angle of the shaft? Okay. The second thing I want to look for, and it's, uh, it's a little hard to tell here on this elongated screen, but if you look at the butt end of the shaft, where is it pointing? Right at the belt line. If you have a student with a palmy left hand grip, what are you going to see? Where's that butt end of the shaft going to be pointed? Well, it's going to be higher, isn't it? More up into the sternum area? Yeah, it's one of my first indicators. Uh, by the way, you, this is, that, that's kind of a general rule. What if your body is like David Ledbetter, who is about six foot four and has about six foot one inches of legs and has this little tiny torso? Okay, where is his, where are the butt end of his shaft going to point? Well, that's going to point into his mid thigh, right? So it's not a whole true statement, but if you can get the body proportions approximately the same on your students, right, if, if they're approximately the same, you're going to point somewhere around the butt end of the shaft pointing to the belt line, somewhere around that angle. Okay. One of the first things that I look for, again, is that angle of the arm hang and the angle of the shaft itself. Okay. All right, let me jump back in here. Well, hold on here. Hey Daniel, I can't get to my uh, my X out here. <laughs> I can't get to my screen over here. Sorry about that, guys. All right, original body lines. I love drawing original body lines. Uh, my favorites are, again, tailbone, forehead, and top of the head. If you draw those three lines, I think you can, uh, you can, you can really see what your body, first of all, is doing at address, but then my, I always like to see what they're doing at impact versus their original body lines. Martin Hall, National Teacher of the Year, calls it his stability house. He wants to see where this house started and where the house finished. Draw original body lines if you have the software capabilities of doing so. And again, the ones that I like to draw are feet, hips, knees, shoulders, and forearms. By the way, how do you as a student, how do you as a player tell if, you're, if your um, upper body is online or not? It's kind of hard to tell where my shoulders are because we've got one on each side of my head. Well, how about looking at your forearms? If your shoulders are open, your forearms will probably be open too. If your shoulders are closed, your forearms probably will be too. All right, eye line. I very much appreciate listening to Mr. Upshaw on the first day talking about eye line. How many of you pay attention to the eye line? We follow our eyes all day long, every day. It's our central nervous system. That's what we do. That's how we're trained. If I have a student and their eyes are this direction, guess where their swing is going to go? Out to in and steep. If their eyes are this way, their, eye, their, their, their club is going to come from underneath or shallow and then, uh, uh, and then out to the right. Watch your eye lines, one of my first looks. Look where their eyes are in relation to the target line, in relation to the target line. Delivery path, target arm, club face, and body relationships. Well, I don't want to get back into to that, but one of my favorite lines is I like to draw a line from the golf ball through the right elbow. And you will see a path in a golf swing that pretty much follows that path all the way through the golf swing. Some people call it the shaft angle and, uh, and Hogan's plane or the shoulder plane, that wedge that some people draw, you've seen that. But draw a line right from the golf ball right through the right elbow. If I get under that line, I consider that shallow or inside. 
If you get over that line, you're going to get steeper from the outside. It's interesting. We talk about plane angles, and you can do this. Let me, uh, let me get a club. All right. If uh, we, we talk about one plane a little bit earlier, one plane with Jim Hardy, great book again, by the way. Um, one plane would have more tilt from the body, and the arm plane would be roughly on the shoulder plane as we take it back. In other words, the shaft of the golf club dictates where the plane of the golf swing goes. But if you look at most players, the shaft line will rise more into a two-plane position and then have to rejoin that original line somewhere into the downswing. Okay, that happens when the right arm folds. If the right arm never folded, I would be on the same plane the whole time. As soon as the right arm folds, I get above that plane. Okay, so the key is, can I return to that plane? Or am I going to get outside or inside or whatever? But draw some sort of a plane line. Again, I personally like from the golf ball through the right elbow. That's the, that's the line I draw. It does not matter to a certain extent as long as you know what you're doing and it's a consistent position as long as you know what you're looking for. Some people, again, draw the shaft line and I want the club to return to the shaft line. It's pretty close. I don't mind that. Hogan's shoulder plane, if you remember that plane of glass in that book that he wrote about. He just always wanted to be under the plane of grass. That, that works too. But I like, again, the elbow plane. Uh, body relationships, again, going back to the original body lines. Impact versus uh, um, original body lines. Now, we're going to get into a slide in just a second, but when you look at original body lines versus physical fitness, sometimes you'll see different positions where you get a student that cannot hold on to the force that they're creating. Remember that 60 to 80 pounds of thrust. Right? If their body is not capable of holding on to that energy, their body is going to move. They're going to get sucked into that vortex of energy. Okay. So sometimes physical fitness is the key for those types of issues. All right, make sense so far? Here, here it comes. To me, this is kind of the end result of what, we, what I wanted to talk about today. If I fit the player for today, and you teach the player for what you'd like to have this player in tomorrow, we get players that look like this. Okay, we get frustrated players. All right. I've seen a lot of fitters try to fix ball flight by changing golf clubs. Okay, this player comes over the top, the marks on the toe, I'll bend the clubs upright and we'll fix that. Well, yes, I think we can again, going back to quick fixes versus long-term player development, I think you can make a change for the better in a short period of time by matching the club to the swing. But is that player ever going to reach their maximum potet potential unless we attach this to some sort of a biomechanical, some sort of a lesson plan to get their motion better? And to me, the answer is no. So I think, again, quick fixes can work if that's what the student is after. But long term, I think this is the best way to do it. Club fitting should be conducted for the now, but with an eye toward the future. A good friend of mine told me that, and I like that. I think that's a pretty good quote. Okay. That's why I think the partnership of instruction and club fitting is the future. Is the future. Are we partners or are we pugilists? Okay. This is something that the PGA is instituting. We've been doing this for about a year at my PGA Center. I just want to take you through this quickly, but this is what we call our TEMPO program, and it stands for technique, which stands for the instruction component. What I do on most days, I'm about 70% of the time I am a, a, a lesson giver. I'm an instructor more than I am a club fitter. About 30% of my time I'm a club fitter. But the instruction, technique, equipment, you have to again match these two together, but there are three other components of what we're doing, with the first one being the mental aspect. For every 1,000 golf swings that I like, I'll show you about five good players. I'll show you about five good players. Being able to swing a golf club and be able to play the game of golf are very, very different skills. And you have to be able to compete on the mental plane. Okay, the physical nature, has anybody, I, I've actually been talking around the room, talking about TPI or some sort of physical training program. Uh, anybody interested in doing that? Right, anybody doing that already in their programs? And you're going to see a swing here in a minute that I think will bear truth to that. Uh, On-course instruction would be the last. Okay? Again, you can be in perfect physical shape. You can have a great mental outlook. Your swing is right on plane and perfect with a lot of speed to it. And if you don't know how to play the game, you're still not much of a player. I think if, you are going, if we are going to build players for the future, we have to be firing on all five of these heads if we're going to actually improve golf swings, if we're actually going to improve, pl improve players. Right? Do you know that the average handicap in the United States has not gone down in the last 25 years? In spite of the fact that we have better equipment, in spite of the fact that we're fitting them better, in spite of the fact that the, the golf courses are in better condition, our handicaps are not going down. Why? 
Well, I think it's one of these five things is not firing. It has to be a holistic approach, a complete approach if we're actually going to improve players. So we actually will take you through a program where we look at your technique, we talk about your equipment, we give you some mental exa exams and, and, and concepts, uh, put you in touch with David Donatucci, our director of fitness, and then we'll actually take you on out on the golf course and show you how to actually play the game. Actually play the game. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit. Of, this is uh, the machine here, and I know I'm running a little bit long. But has anybody used force plate technology when they teach or when they fit? Anybody heard of force plate technology? Or, or, or uh, Yes, great, outstanding. Uh, basically what this has happened, I've got one up here on the, on the platform. If you want to come during lunch, we can, I can maybe show you some of the things on it. But it is basically, the machine that we use is called the Dynamic Balance System. It's invented by a guy named Dan Goldstein, who is a physical therapist from West Palm Beach. And he has partnered with the PGA for a number of years. We actually presented at the Teaching and Coaching Summit about th uh, two years ago. It basically is a machine that measures the pressure in your feet and also assumes a center of gravity based on your height. Okay, so it's not just simply pressure in your feet, it's actually triangulation off a of height measurement. Okay? It drops 100 dots per second during your golf swing and shows us where our center of gravity has moved throughout the golf swing. If you look at this graph that we have up here, the red dots that you're seeing are anything that moves to the right is red, and anything that is on this screen purple, but in real life is blue, is anything that moves to the left, and then the circle is where my center of mass or my center of gravity was at the moment of ball impact. Okay? The two horizontal black lines you see, the bottom one is the heel joint, and the top one is the metatarsal head or the ball of your foot. Okay? I call this, uh, stole this from Dan, but the, he calls this the balance zone. I think golf swing should happen behind the ball of the foot and in front of the heel joint, otherwise known as the arch of your foot. If you look at the way the bones come off of your shin, those five tarsals that come off of there, those actually have some rotary capacity to them. They can actually support and allow the body to move the way it wants to. Okay, probably disagreeing over here to the doctor. But. No, I was just thinking about that. Uh -huh. They actually have a little rotary force where the tarsals or the, met or the metatarsals or the heel joint, really not the best place to be in my opinion. Right? This would actually be a pretty good swing. Ball impact would be slightly left of center and slightly more heel than toe. And this is what he has found with the majority of the great players that he has seen, this would be more of the pattern that we have. Does everybody understand the graph and how it works? 100 dots per second, red dots go to the right, blue dots go to the left, okay? High handicap players, this is what I see. These are some of the graphs of the high handicap players that I see. Center of gravity movement patterns. Anybody wanna to try to fit those golf swings? Not me. Those are, my those are yours? I stole those from you, didn't I? Right. Yeah, you can see the one on the top left, pretty good backswing, pretty much straight line progression to the right foot, a little bit more toward the heel over here. And then uh, something happened right up in here in our weight position. By the way, this last line is 100% of the mass, so if that impact position gets outside of that line, then you need to call the ambulance because he just broke his nose on the pavement. Okay, right. Uh, so that one on the top left there, how are you going to fit that position? Well, gosh, you'd have to give them very short, very upright golf clubs, right, if you're going to fit that position? Dynamic balance system. I do have information about Dan. If, if you want to give me your card and write DBS on the back of it, I can, make, I can have Dan call you. It's a great machine. It's actually re relatively low priced. Right. So again, I think you can fit that golf swing in the top left and make that guy a better player, but is that really something we'd be interested in doing? Well, again, does, is he playing in the club championship tomorrow afternoon? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. All right. Um, this, is a, this is a position that's actually filmed at the learning center here under the lights. But you can see the gentleman standing on the, on the balance plate. And we've drawn some original body lines with the video. And let's see what he looks like at the moment of impact. Anything change there? Okay. You can see that our center of gravity has moved dramatically forward. Our hands have risen some, and some of that's natural. Your hands are going to rise some anyway, but I wouldn't put that in, in the case of, of a natural position. I'm thinking we're going to have a hard time being very consistent from that position. Right? This is what the graph would look like on that golf swing. Right? And you can see how the video ties into the balance plate. Very convincing to my students. By the way, if this is where my center of gravity is, 
at the start of the uh, address position or the start of the golf swing. And it's way up there at the impact position. Didn't he just get closer to the golf ball in the golf swing? Well, gosh, if I got closer to the golf ball, I'd better adjust something to fix it, which he's done. If we had a face on view, you're exactly right, Mr. Marshall. Absolutely true. So again, we can definitely do that. If you did a static LIBOR test on this guy, you'd see he'd be marking it up on the toe. You'd, you'd, you'd fit him for four degrees upright, and, and he'd be happy today. But I'm not sure that's the position I'd want him to be in for the rest of his life. Will that make sense? All right, pretty interesting graph here. I love combining technologies, and I really do think that is the future. When you combine video and force plate and launch data, I think that is the future of where we're going as an industry. But I just love this graph. You can see how the body moves forward, and it's represented dynamically there. All right, All right player number one. This is something I think is, is, uh, is exactly where we need to be as fitters and teachers. This is one player who had a pitching wedge, a five iron, and a driver. Anything you notice about those three graphs? Where is the circle? Where is the impact position with all three golf clubs? Okay, we call this a contact cluster. Now, to me, as a fitter, this is what I would be after. Okay, well, as an instructor, too, this is what I would be after. I want to be able to make the same golf swing with my pitching wedge, roughly, as far as a balance position goes, as I do with a five iron, as I do with a driver. Okay, that, to me, would be ideal. Here's player number two with the pitching wedge. Went deep into the right heel, into the backswing, way up into the left toe in the downswing. The five iron deep into the right heel in the backswing, further up into the left toe, and actually starting to back up a little bit. You can see the moment of impact, we are actually moving away from the target. Anybody see a reverse pivot as we went through there? And then here we are with the driver. Okay. Now, if you look at that swing, if you look at all three of those, isn't that the same pattern? It's roughly the same pattern. I would put that probably in video. You're probably going to say, that's the same golf swing. Okay, but it's not the same impact position. Okay, here's our contact cluster. Pitching wedge, five iron, and driver. Right, we're almost ready to call that ambulance with the driver, aren't we? Right, almost ready to call that. Again, can you fit to that position? Or let me ask that question another way. Is it fitting that caused that position? Is it fitting that caused that position with the driver? In our students' ever-present desire for more speed, I feel the need for speed, wouldn't that indicate maybe the driver's too long? If that driver's too long, I've got to find a way to create some space or too heavy. I'd buy that too, right? So is that a swing issue that the fitting is trying to compensate for, or is that a fitting issue that the swing is trying to compensate for? I don't know the answer to that question, but they're obviously complementary positions. Right. If you compare these two players, who's going to be longer? Who's going to be the longer of these two players? One on the right. <laughs> Great question, Jerry. Who's going to be more consistent? One on the left. Who's the tour pro? Here's the scary. Okay. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I think you, I would too, because the one on the right is no longer a tour player. In fact, the one on the right has actually hurt his back.